Well, hello, and we're delighted that you've all joined us for this important event here at Strathclyde University. It's an event jointly hosted by the university and with INEOS. The title of today's event is Fueling the Future, and the topic for discussion is the role of the chemicals industry in the transition to net zero. I'm Jim Murphy, the former UK Cabinet Minister and former Secretary, Secretary of State for Scotland, Managing Director of Arden Strategies, and I am today's facilitator of our conversation. This is a unique event, and we brought together a really compelling combination of senior panellists to join the conversation, each of whom has a distinctive voice in the challenges and opportunities of the chemicals industry towards net zero. I anticipate that today's conversation will be wide-ranging, provocative, and constructive. I would anticipate that we will cover issues as diverse as green jobs, workplace protections, the contribution of engineering and technology to the transition, developments in the chemicals industry and towards transition to net zero, and also how the Scottish and UK governments are working in partnership with business to achieve those objectives. Now, to enable us to dive right into the conversation, um, each of our panellists have agreed to speak for just three minutes. Um, we won't, I won't be stringent on that, but that's what we will aim for. Those who have joined us physically today will enjoy that, and those, the many who will join us online as well, will notice that. So to introduce our panellists um, at today's event, um, we start with Dr. Brian Gilvari on my left, who is the Executive Chairman of INEOS Energy. Brian brings a wealth of experience to today's conversation and to that role. Amongst his career highlights are more than three decades at BP. He was recently awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Energy Council for his outstanding contribution to the industry. A mathematician by training, he is also currently Senior Independent Director at Barclays. Next we have Ivan McKee. I'm delighted that Ivan has joined us today. Ivan is, as well as being an MSP um, for Glasgow in the Scottish Parliament, today's conversation is, we're delighted he's here because he's also the Scottish Government Minister for Business, for Trade, for Tourism and for Enterprise. And each of those roles will be enough of a job for one person. And I have no idea how you fit all four into, into one life. But anyway, Ivan's career has spanned several senior roles in manufacturing and business in the UK and internationally. He was previously the Minister for Trade, Investment and Innovation. Um, next we have um, Nishma Patel. Nishma is the Policy Director at the Chemicals Industries Association. Nishma, Nishma leads on policy development for the UK's nationwide trade body, representing the industry. She has extensive experience across a dozen years in the sector and is widely respected for her expertise in the most important legislation on chemicals and supply. A biochemist by training, she is a leading voice in helping to shape the industry's actions as well as thoughts on the transition to net zero. And then we have Gary Smith. Gary is the General Secretary of the General Municipal and Boilermakers Union, GMB for short. The GMB is the UK's third largest union with 600,000 members. He represents workers in the chemicals industry and in most manufacturing sections of the UK economy. Gary, although just recently elected to the post, is already arguably the UK's leading and persuasive voice on a, a just transition that maximises the opportunities for British manufacturing and British jobs. And we'll also be joined by Professor Jim MacDonald, who I'll introduce at that moment. Now, if I can invite our guests to speak for three minutes, and I'll take them in this order here. I'll go, I'll go with um, Brian to begin with. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, I think we're in an extraordinary moment at the moment in terms of change and climate. I think the evidence now is absolutely irrefutable that the planet is warming and we need to do something about it. And in fact, indeed, over the last 
six years, we've had the four highest temperatures the planet's ever seen. So I don't think people are any longer arguing about climate. It's really about what we're going to do about it. I think the second part is that um, economic growth and energy growth are inextricably linked to population growth. So the more people we have on the planet, the more energy and access to energy and all these wonderful little laptops and phones that we carry around with us that need charging up, there will be a desire for more energy. What is clear is the way in which we've supplied that energy historically over the last 260 years will have to change for the next period of time. And the carbon appetite and the CO2 associated with that energy that we've used to great effect that's driven like economic growth over the last 100 years or so is going to have to be different going forward. And so as we look at the future, today we have something like 84% of the world's energy consumption comes from fossil fuels. 33% from coal, 27% uh, from oil, 27% from coal, and 30% from gas. 6% comes from hydro. Hydro is pretty much done around the world uh, in terms of opportunity set, so it's not going to grow as fast as where the population goes in the mix. Nuclear since Fukushima has become more difficult, even though people are now starting to come back to nuclear as a source of energy, and that makes up about 4%. Renewables makes up about 5%. What's clear in this next big energy transition, and it's the fourth energy transition the planet's been through, from wood to coal, coal to oil, oil to gas, and now into this fourth energy transition, which is quite exciting in terms of the range of possible things we can do. Clearly, we're going to have to grow renewables as fast as we possibly can. To do that, we're going to need access to the chemical products that companies like INEOS produce. So, for example, you can't make solar cells without acetic acid. You can't build insulation around copper pipes for all the electrification we're going to need without the polymers that make those, make those products. So, growing renewables as fast as possible will need chemical products. We'll need to get more energy efficient in how we do it. And those of us that lived around the 70s remember how energy efficient we had to get as we sat around candles for the best part of three or four days a week. We're going to need to get more, more effective in our use of energy. And that actually will help with the CO2 problem. Here down the road at Grangemouth, since we took that plant on, we've been able to reduce our CO2 footprint by 40%. A lot of that is around energy efficiency. We did the same thing at Runcorn, around 55%. The third part of this mix is going to be able to develop um, solutions that will allow us to capture the carbon dioxide that's associated with the products we produce. Now, even the IPCC, the Intergovernary Panel on Climate Change, said that we expected to meet net zero by 2050, we'll need to sequester store up to 25 to 40% of CO2. There are two big projects in EOS are involved in, one in Denmark around carbon capture, and one here with the ACORN project in Scotland, which will be crucial for the UK meeting its CO2 requirement. The ACORN project can store up to about 60% of the CO2 we're going to need. And the fourth part of the equation as we look into the future will be hydrogen. Hydrogen is, as in, and I, I was on the board of Earl Key for the best part of five years, has now risen up the agenda as not a silver bullet, but certainly a major bullet in our armory in terms of solving climate change. And why is it so important? Because its byproduct is water, and we have the infrastructure to move the hydrogen around today via natural gas. That, I think, will be a big part of the future. And EOS has already announced this week that, and I don't want too many plugs here for EOS, but we've committed to spend 2 billion euros on green hydrogen over the next couple of decades. So we're going to need a multiple series of solutions to solve climate change. Um, and renewables is important, but oil, gas, and fossil fuel in the future mix, and the carbon capture with that will be equally important if we're going to get to net zero. Thank you, Brian. A fantastic way to kick off our roundtable today. It's not so much a roundtable, is it? COVID, COVID prevents it being a roundtable, but a, a horseshoe table. Oh, there's no table. So <laughs> a horseshoe set of seats. Um, Ivan, I wonder if you could um, introduce your reflections on this subject and just give us a flavour of the Scottish Government's efforts. Sure. No, absolutely, Jim. And thanks very much for chairing it. And thanks to uh, NAS and uh, University of Strathclyde for organising and hosting the event. And it's great to see the, the, the collection of speakers you've got. So we've got trade unions, academia, government, business all working together to uh, address uh, this very important issue, as Brian has outlined, and what we can do to work in partnership to take that 
to that agenda forward. Um, and Scotland recognised the importance of the, the, the chemical sector, uh, both to the economy, but also very much to the products it produces. And, and Brian's outlined the, the centrality of many of those products to uh, the work we need to do in the transition to, uh, to net zero and renewable energy sources. Um, and we're also very proud of the, the, the efforts, the achievements that we've delivered um, in, uh, in that decarbonisation agenda. We're now at a position where the electricity we're using in this room in Scotland, 100% of it comes from renewable sources, something we're, we're very proud of and we continue to move forward um, aggressively on our uh, agenda on decarbonisation of heat uh, and, uh, and transport and working very closely with the chemical sector to address the, uh, the challenges that uh, that sector has to, uh, to decarbonise as well. But we're also very clear that that has to be done uh, in, in a just way that's fair for uh, individuals, workers, their families, communities, businesses uh, and the regions of Scotland uh, and that's an absolutely central plank to the work we're taking forward. We've learnt from previous uh, deindustrialisation bitterly in Scotland of the impact that uh, not doing this in a just way can have and that's a huge uh, focus of the, the efforts that we are taking forward. So I'll stop there but I think that gives an outline of our perspective on the challenge and our commitment to delivering on that, uh, that, that net zero um, transition and doing it in a just way. Thank you, Ivan. Great. Now, Nishma, you work in this issue. Um, you, uh, you work for a dozen, as I said in the introduction, for a dozen years you've worked in the chemicals industry. I wonder if you could offer your introductory reflections. Yeah, um, thank you. So, um, I guess uh, for the chemical industry, um, you know, delivering net zero cannot be overstated. Um, Whichever part of the business I talk to, whether it's the leaders, the management, the workforce, today's workforce and tomorrow's, they are in it together. They want to deliver net zero, um, not just today, but have, have done so for, for years as well. So, so two key things of why it's important to the industry. Um, the first is, is that no matter where you do chemistry, whether it's here in the UK or elsewhere, you need energy to, to break chemical bonds. There's, there's no other way of, of getting around it, no other way of, of doing chemistry, essentially, for, for the most part. So in order to be able to run our plants and processes as economically as possible, um, we need access to clean and competitive energy. So this hasn't started a few years ago for the industry. Um, in fact, for the past three decades, industry's working, been working very hard to decarbonise its operations, its plants, um, in terms of its direct scope and its direct emissions as well. Um, some of it's been simple things like insulating pipe, um, replacing boilers, um, and now looking at some of the bigger sort of transition needs that are needed to bring that next stage of transition to the industry. We've done, we've done a big chunk. Where, what do we need to do to get to that next big chunk of decarbonisation too? Um, and then the other key thing for, and what is important for industry is obviously it supplies or it um, provides, its products and technologies provide around 95% to other industries. So it's a key supplier to, to many other manufacturing industries, whether that's traditional or advance, um, but we are an invisible part of the supply chain. Um, as my daughters qu constantly ask me, "What is it that you do, Mummy? What, what, what do you What do you do as a day job?" And I and I and I have to constantly point out, "Well, that product you're using there, actually, if you work up the supply chain, this is where it comes from. Obviously, it, it goes down to basics, but hopefully, they get the gist of of, of what where, where things come from." Um, so it is an invisible part of the supply chain. Recent challenges and opportunities actually show, have shown and recognised what an essential building block chemistry is. There's a lot more work to do and I hope Net Zero provides us that opportunity to, to demonstrate that even further. So not only can we deliver Net Zero for our own industry, but we're a key pillar of delivering it for, for other industries too. Um, and that supply chain connectivity is so important in delivery, not just supply chain within our own industry, but working with our customers um, working with government, that partnership, pulling all those levers, levers in parallel, is what is needed to deliver net zero. So I'll stop Thank there. You, Thank you. And Gary, a, a workplace and worker perspective on this discussion? I was just was to say, my mother asked me every day what I do for a living as a trade union <laughs> official, but um, um, there you go. Um, well, maybe I'll be the controversial uh, in some of this, Jim. Um, the, the, the eyes of the world are going to be on Glasgow and Scotland in the coming weeks, and uh, what they're going to see is a city where the public realm is crumbling, our roads are full of potholes, our streets can't be swept, our children go to school uh, hungry, and uh, many other people are uh, seriously disadvantaged. Indeed, it's a city built on discrimination against working class uh, women. 
And Scotland as a whole uh, is a model, in my view, for how you don't do just transition, because the backdrop, of course, to COP will be a litany of broken political and industrial promises over uh, jobs uh, here in Scotland. We've been promised so much in terms of renewables, yet yards the length and breadth of this country lie empty, and most of the work in the renewable sector has uh, gone abroad. And my challenge to you, Minister, would be this. If we are 100% renewables today and it didn't feel very windy coming in for Paisley, let's turn off the two nuclear power plants and let's switch off the electricity that's coming up from uh, down south being produced by gas and see if we manage to keep the lights on. Uh, because actually energy is far more complicated than some of the political sloganeering uh, that, we, uh, that we get. In terms of chemicals, hugely important sector in the economy, uh, supporting around 500,000 jobs, including this, in the supply chain, uh, tend to be well-paid jobs. We represent the workers at Ennius in the northwest of England. They're not that well, not well enough paid, but they <laughs> possibly just above average. I don't, the, the employers cast these things up to you. I remember when you said, but you know, in all seriousness, tend to be higher paid jobs. The unions have paid a part in that over the years with good standards of safety now, and the unions have been absolutely uh, integral to that as well. And of course, people are, have woken up to the fact that chemicals and gas, uh, in the past few weeks, we're starting to wake up to the fact that this is actually far more complicated than sloganeering at political conferences uh, would have us uh, believe. In terms of our members, I think our priorities, we want to see investment in new nuclear, in hydrogen. We think hydrogen is going to be very important. I was with JCB yesterday, really interesting in terms of their large machines for the construction sector. They are not going to be run on batteries. Uh, that's just the truth of the matter. So we're going to have to find uh, uh, other solutions. We are going to have to deal with the disadvantage in the UK, the costs that are being heaped on industry, be it carbon or be it in energy, because it's costing jobs and investment is suffering as a result. And we are going to have a balanced energy policy. And again, Minister, whether the Scottish Government likes it or not, we're going to have to face into, if we're serious about low carbon electricity, we have to face into uh, new nuclear. And to meet our energy needs, we are going to have to uh, deal uh, with hydrogen as well. And finally, you know, the backdrop to COP is that emissions in the UK have dropped enormously over the past number of decades. Uh, but the truth is we have been involved in a form of industrial, uh, dis uh, industrial disarmament. We have been offshoring jobs, offshoring carbon produ production. So we've offshored work and we're importing virtue. And that has got to stop. If we are serious about dealing with climate change, we need to start bringing uh, the work home and politicians are going to have to face up to that reality. We need to stop the just transition being uh, more than just about raising energy bills for the poorest because that is what's happened. It needs to mean more than jobs just sweeping up dead birds, which is the reality uh, for so many of us in Scotland. And we need to stop talking at workers in industries, carbon uh, intensive industries, and we need to start working with trade unions, with workers, and with working class communities. Because the backlash about the economics around some of this it will, it will, for somebody who's from the left, I fear this will break to the right. Uh, and that will be enormously damaging in terms of alienating ordinary working people from what we need to do in terms of cleaning up uh, the environment and tackling climate change. Thank you, Jim. Great, thank you, Gary. And I can't believe that after those sorts of comments, your mother still doesn't know what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she's listening to you. <laughs> well, thank you all for your introductory comments. Um, now, uh, what we want to try and do now is just have a free-flowing conversation. Um, and I'll start it off by asking, posing a couple of questions. And I know, Ivan, you've got to get, to, you've got to be back in Edinburgh for a pre-arranged um, engagement. So some of the some of the conversation inevitably will be um, focused on, um, on the, the Scottish Government. But I wonder if I could come to yourself first, Ivan, and have a sense of what is the biggest challenge? I've asked two questions, and this is great for politicians. As, as a former politician, you can answer the one you want to and ignore the one you don't. That's, so that's fine, absolutely fine. Um, so what do you think is the, the biggest challenge facing the industry that we've been talking about already today? And is it possible to make the investment needed to become carbon neutral and remain competitive? 
Yeah, well, I think, uh, and I'll try and answer both of those questions. Um, in terms of the, the, the biggest challenge facing the industry, I mean, it's great to see the commitment from NAS of a billion pound investment to help move, uh, move this decarbonisation agenda forward in the sector. It's something that the Scottish Government is, uh, is hugely committed to support. It's something we identified um, decarbonisation of the chemical sector as one of the priorities in our inward investment strategy um, and how we see the development of, uh, of Scotland's um, industrial base going forward. So um, tackling that decarbonisation is the, the biggest challenge. The fact uh, of the UK government's announcement on the ACON project uh, this week was extremely unhelpful in that, uh, in that regard and, and, and makes that challenge more difficult. But clearly that decarbonisation of the sector is, uh, is the biggest challenge. Um, in terms of the... Um, the investment aspects and the cost aspects of this? The answer is yes. I mean, it will be, there will be costs involved in this, but there'll be a huge number of opportunities. First mover advantage in those technologies is, uh, is very key in that regard. Um, and Scotland needs to do all it can to be ahead of the curve on those technologies, be it floating offshore wind, where we, we enjoy a, um, a, a good, uh, some good advantages, be it in terms of the uh, um, tidal and other, um, other marine technologies, be it in terms of hydrogen, um, blue hydrogen, and, uh, and moving on to, to green hydrogen and joining up all the challenges and that, uh, that, that are involved in bringing those technologies to fruition. So there's a huge amount of opportunity there as well, and I think we need to be focused as much on that, investing in those technologies, investing in the, the capability and the capacity and the skills to be able to take advantage of those going forward. And frankly, like so much innovation through recent uh, year, years, decades, centuries, um, the, uh, the, when everything settles down, the cost will be lower, um, the opportunities will be greater, and the, the, the key is for us to be able to take advantage of those in, in, in the best possible way on the global stage. Thank you, Ivan. And Brian, can I ask, uh, pose both, both questions to you as well, and also invite you to reflect on the recent decision on, on the ACON project not being included in the first track? Yeah, um, let me pick up ACON first because that's, it's sort of, I'd agree, it's surprising that that didn't get the go-ahead. Maybe there are things going on around the government's levelling up agenda, northwest, northeast, uh, England maybe, but I think ACON has to go ahead. I think it's, it would be crazy for it not to proceed um, in terms of the ability of that, it's the largest project we have in terms of North Sea and what we can do around carbon capture. Um, it can take up to 60% of the CO2 that we're going to need to get to net zero. So I think you've got to have ACORN in the mix. And therefore, I'd be very surprised if at some point that doesn't finally get um, the approval to go forward. In terms of the big challenges going forward is ultimately, um, capital will find a way to make a return. It's got a global market to play in. So I think here in the UK, you have to set the right framework to encourage investments that will drive jobs and job creation, because that's going to be an important part of this energy transition. And I think the big challenge for companies uh, like ours is, ultimately what you want is a safe and reliable operation for your employees to go to each day and go home safe. So that's a big challenge for us going forward as we go through some of these big technology changes. And I think hydrogen is a great example. I mean, I, I, I look, I've been in and around this energy transition phase now for the best part of three decades. I've lived and breathed it in terms of, and, and what is fantastic after 2015 is everybody now has come together and COP26 here is going to be really, really important. Uh, it, I think there's a lot of anticipation around what may or may not get agreed around COP26, but I think it's going to be crucial to set the agenda going forward because the world has moved on and said that we now need to start to tackle these problems going forward. Hydrogen, having sort of looked at this mix of 80, it was 85% fossil fuel, oil, oil, gas, coal, and, you know, renewables, not, you know, even if you grow them at 300%, they can't solve this problem of the population growing and needing more energy. Hydrogen would appear to be able to give us a major step forward, but we need the regulatory framework and the incentives in place to encourage the investment that will come. So today, Germany is incredibly well advanced. They've set the framework in place. They know what they want to do. Um, and, and that will attract investment into jobs, into industry, and into creating this energy transition. Same thing in Scandinavia at different points. The UK, we've talked a lot about hydrogen, but we haven't really yet put in place a framework that's going to bring the investment in. And I think that will be important for the energy transition. Thank you, Brian. Before I come to this side, um, I just want to ask, um, Ivan, when you, when you look at um, the some international comparators, and Brian's mentioned Germany, Again, two questions. 
Um, are, are there other countries that you think the, Scotland and the UK could learn from um, that you're trying to model, the Scottish Government's trying to model itself on? And what, what are the specific role of the Scottish Government in, 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 to enable the, the success of the transition in this sector and in other aspects of heavy manu manufacturing? Yeah, and in terms of other countries, there are several. Obviously, Denmark's an interesting example. And I had a great meeting with some uh, Danish businesses earlier this week to, to talk about more about how they've done that and what we can learn from it. They got an early on uh, offshore wind and uh, established some significant capacity, which has put them in a... a, a, a a good place that it's, it's something we can replicate as we move, as I said, to, to floating offshore wind and then to marine and, uh, and hydrogen going forward. So I think there's, there's quite a lot to learn there and some other Scandinavian countries as well. Um, and South Korea is another country that's got some clear focus there um, in, in terms of the industrialisation aspects of this, um, in terms of the um, the regulatory aspects of this and, and the, uh, the, what the Scottish Government can do. Clearly, energy policy is reserved to, to Westminster. Um, like many things, it's something that we would like to uh, to have under uh, our control and if you look at an independent country like Denmark of five million people it's managed to do um, uh, because it has all those levers at, at its disposal and we don't um, so it's um, there's a limit clearly to what we can do but um, where we have got to uh, scope is uh, in terms of how we support that just transition how we invest money and we're clearly investing hundreds of millions of pounds um, in technologies and skills and in that uh, the, the, those uh, the, the, the work around about the just transition uh, and it's setting a, a political direction and signal um, we're the first country in the world to declare the climate emergency, for example, and it's about pressurising the UK government to get them to move faster along that uh, along that agenda. So there are things we can do, there are levers we can pull, but as I say, we don't have control of the full range of, of powers we'd like to, to do to move as fast as we can. And this, you look at um, contracts for difference, for example, if you look at the the um, in your technologies, which, which isn't, isn't in place and would be very helpful, if you look at uh, connection charges in terms of the grid, the reality that because we are further away from London, we have to pay significantly more to connect renewables into the grid. All of those things are policy decisions made in Westminster that really mitigate against um, Scotland moving forward as fast as we'd like to on the energy transition. Okay. And w <coughs> what would the Scottish Government, because that's, um, if you don't mind me saying, that's a list of things that you don't want another government to do um, or that you would like another government to do. In terms of the Scottish Government, what's the Scottish Government's specific role within the powers that you do have and the influence that you have? Well, as I said, what we'd like to do is we'd like to have powers so that we could deal with those things ourselves. But uh -huh. that's the reality of where we are. We have to do that. As I mentioned, the amount of money we're putting in to support technologies, the work we do with universities and innovation centres, uh, the support we do for specific businesses in the sector um, uh, adds up to a significant amount of money. The amount of money we're putting into the Green Skills Fund, for example, is hundreds of millions of pounds, the amount of money uh, that we're, 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 we're focused on, the, the just transition and working with communities with reskilling and a whole range of aspects there. So there are things across um, enterprise business support, skills, um, that we can do and at the political level, as I say, that, that messaging is also very important. And it was interesting, I was in at Global Investment Summit earlier this week in London and the UK government is, is moving um, in, in, in um, a, a more favourable direction around about net zero. And, and frankly, I think the, uh, the messaging that we've been putting out on that has helped to, to, to drag them along that, uh, along that path. Thank you, Ivan. Um, Nishma, I wonder if you can... And we've been joined by um, Sir Jim McDonald. We'll, we'll introduce him in just a moment. We'll, um, after Nishma and Gary have had a chance to reflect on um, these questions about um, the biggest challenge facing the sector and what is it you would like, what's the most important change that you would like to see either from Scottish, UK government or regulation more generally? Yeah, so I think um, depending on where companies are sitting in the supply chain within the industry, um, I think that the, the key challenge we hear today and here now is supply chain issues. But when you look underneath that, um, there are two key underlying root causes that we see today. Uh, one is the logistics challenge, um, and that's linked to infrastructure, which I'll mention in a bit. And the other one is obviously, um, you go back, you've got increase in, production, uh, increase in raw material prices, or you've got a difficulty in actually um, finding your raw materials that you need. So there's, there's a shortage in raw materials too. You take that back, ultimately what you find is that the energy cost at, well, that we're facing at the moment is a key component in, in, that, in that area. So at the moment, um, there's been an exponential increase for, for the industry in terms of the energy prices. It's, it's one of their biggest operating costs. Um, so there is a need you know, around looking at 
the systemic issues around how the energy market works in the UK, um, how it needs to work as we transition. Um, it doesn't work for, for today's energy market, so let alone for, for that new market that we'll look to. And with renewables, I think we need to consider a lot of issues that we don't have today in terms of the energy market. So, for example, storage, for example, infrastructure, and of course, supply and supply and demand markets too. So how do we have a market, a policy around network costs, um, energy costs that actually reflect um, demand both from industrial and domestic consumers? Thank you, Nishma. Gary, <laughs> Gary, I wonder whether you could reflect on what, what, what it would take for you as a trade union leader um, to feel that the government is um, taking decisive action on an agenda that does protect jobs and manufacturing in Scotland and the UK? Uh, Jim, as I mentioned this earlier, uh, emissions in the UK have been falling for decades because we've been exporting jobs to countries like China. We've been exporting our jobs an important uh, virtue. And uh, in terms of Scotland, one in six jobs in manufacturing have gone since 2010. So I'm not quite clear what the devolved parliament, which was there and developed to help rebalance the economy in Scotland, I don't know exactly what it's doing and what the Scottish government are doing. And the truth is, in terms of uh, much of our, the vast bulk of our offshore uh, wind capacity, including new, new technologies, it's been manufactured and fabricated abroad. It's not been done here in Scotland. And the UK government has been hopeless and the whole litany of broken promises, but it's no better here in Scotland. And let's not forget the two yards that, that could have benefited from renewables, the Bifab yards, those yards were muddy fields and they were owned by the Scottish government because Denmark was invested in the future and the Scottish government did, didn't. What we need is less policy papers and promises around just transitions uh, because if policy papers equated to jobs, Scotland would be booming. What we need is a plan, uh, a plan of action that's going to create jobs and it is actually going to drive investment. My challenge to the UK and Scottish government is where is our new Aberdeen going to be created? We had a global centre for oil and gas in Scotland. Where is that happening as part of any energy transition? Great. Now, our next speaker is possibly going to see the University of Strathclyde is that global centre. Uh, <laughs> I'm delighted that we're joined today um, by um, Sir Jim McDonald, Professor of Strathclyde University, or University of Strathclyde, I'm sorry, um, a role that he has um, fulfilled with distinction since 2009. Um, uh, multiple degrees, let me just read this because I won't remember them all, in electrical engineering, power systems, and energy economics. He's also um, president of the UK's Royal Academy of Engineering, and under his leadership, the university has rightly won plaudits um, for its focus in engineering and in manufacturing, which has led to the university itself being increasingly been referred to by some commentators as the UK's equivalent of MIT. Now, so Jim, we um, started by inviting all of our, our speakers today to just offer a three minute reflection on the contribution that the chemicals industry can make to net zero, the challenges and opportunities, and inevitably, all of our speakers ranged a little wider. And I wonder if we could, I could just invite you to offer your initial reflections. Sure, thanks, Jim, and I'm delighted to join a, a distinguished panel like this, such a, a diverse group of, of views as well. So, so I'm, a, I'm a humble engineer, Jim, if that's not an oxymoron. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few general references. So, so what do we need from my perspective? Uh, well, we need a plan uh, and we need a design. Uh, and what's been missing from the UK for arguably 30 years has been an overarching energy policy. Uh, what it is that we're trying to achieve, I think we understand what the drivers are, but the indisputable data around climate change. It has to be addressed. Uh, we understand why it has to be done. What's been missing is, is how and when. Uh, and uh, I'd like to say that uh, I, th I think in Scotland and in the UK more broadly, I think there's that, that awakening now that we need a strong partnership between industry, and that includes uh, companies such as Ineos, of course, uh, with public sector agencies, the investment community, because we mustn't forget, this is going to cost a lot of money in the energy transition, uh, and of course the academic sector. The UK has, has, a, has an outstanding academic base, uh, and to the point that Gary's made as well, we need to be creating jobs and opportunity as we go. Just transition is important, absolutely key, but we need to understand how does that work. So my general view would be uh, every sector has to engage in the net zero journey. 
Uh, it's an enormous challenge. We've seen uh, recently that the UK government's net zero strategy, and there's a lot to be commended in there, but there's a lot of uh, gaps still. Now, we can't expect it to be a complete plan, uh, but uh, I would suggest that you know, Scottish government's commitment to offshore renewables, uh, and, and I'm more than happy to discuss with Gary and others, it seems to me also a commitment to create the manufacturing jobs and the fabrication and the infrastructure that we need to invest in to attract investment. So, uh, I mean, I won't go into the detail just now in a, in a, in a short period, Jim, but uh, we, have a, we have missed again out on the opportunity for wind jobs over the past 10 years. We've touched on uh, some of the high profile uh, uh, challenges, but uh, I truly believe when we talk about sustainable fuels, but I think one of the most sustainable fuels is optimism. Uh, and, and we have to keep on applying that. We need to address this against an overarching uh, systems approach to achieving net zero. Uh, the Prime Minister has accepted that. I, I sit on the Council for Science and Technology. The paper that we submitted early in 2020 was accepted in, entirely. We saw the, tw the 10 point plan that he published, the new energy white paper. Uh, you know, uh, Ivan and, and his government have you know, again recommitted to the 2045 plans. But we need to understand the key interdependencies. It's not just technology, but it is technology and innovation. It's not just uh, innovation in academia, but it's certainly that. So we need to see how policy, investment, technology, and an overarching plan interact. And as engineer, I call that systems thinking. And it doesn't happen often enough in government, and I say that respect, respectfully, but we need that systems approach to delivering a net zero future that creates economic opportunity as we go. And a friend of mine, Lord Nick Stern, made that very proposition 15 years ago uh, in the economics of climate change. And I'm glad to say he'll be in Glasgow for COP26 extolling the same virtues. But what we need to do now is move to action and let's do it quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, I wonder then if I can just um, encourage you to, ref to reflect um, additionally on what you see as the role of um, university-based innovation in this this conversation? Absolutely. You, you, I mean, some flags have been unfurled uh, in the past couple of years, which are very attractive. UK government's commitment to £22 billion expenditure on R&D and innovation by 2024. I've been having conversations very recently about that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the challenge and the opportunity to create an innovation nation. And I know that's not just a UK objective. Our, our friends and colleagues in Scottish Enterprise, I know, will be driving an innovation agenda. So uh, academia uh, is there to preserve a, a basic research capability. Uh, the UK uh, compares very well uh, with international uh, uh, metrics around the world with its publications, Nobel laureates, etc. But what we haven't done as well as we should have done is do the translational piece. We must keep our discovery research base strong. There's, there can be no argument about that, in my humble opinion. But uh, we spend less than 40% of our funding in the UK on translation into jobs, innovation and opportunity. In Israel, it's about 80%. Uh, in the United States, about 60%. Uh, but it shouldn't be uh, pitting basic research against innovation. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ecosystem. And if we're going to drive tax benefits through innovation, we need healthy research. And if we're going to fund good research, we need industry to create jobs, create economic opportunity, and create markets. Thank you, Jim. Now, the Minister does have to leave, but I'm going to ask him two very short questions, which both encourage very short answers. Um, I, uh, picking up on Jim's point about um, f optimism as the fuel of the future, what, looking around this landscape, what, what makes you feel the most optimistic about um, the transition? And secondly, how long do you, f do you and the government, Scottish Government feel that we will continue to need and exploit the resources of North Sea oil and gas for? Well, in terms of the second question, we've clearly got a commitment to net zero by 2045 and milestones along that route. So I think that kind of lays out um, the, the, the timeline and uh, the, the, the work that we need to do to, uh, to deliver on that. And when you talk to the sector um, at all levels from the major um, uh, uh, majors in the sector right down through the supply chain. Um, everybody is hugely focused. Um, and I think the point I would make is, though, that what we will, we will 
will find as we move down that path is that renewable technologies will become cheaper, more reliable, more effective, um, and the, that transition to a large extent by, by pushing on the, the supply side of that in terms of technology investment and so on, that uh, a lot of that will, will, will happen naturally anyway, but we're moving that as fast as we can and to say working very closely with the sector on it. And your other point optimism. was I know you've got to optimism. run, so tell me about um, the optimism. Yeah, well, I think when you train, look at that right across the, the, the piece, and that's from people that you talk to that you meet um, in other walks of life who, who get it, you look at young people in particular hugely focused on or what needs to be done, and we'll see that through the course of COP in terms of people that are, that are taking part in it and, and, and that are very exercised by the reality as has been identified of what we need to do there. But you look at that through the business community as well, which is hugely focused on it, the investment community that understands it's the right thing to do, but also understands that uh, there's, um, it, 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 there are very investable propositions and they're going to be increasingly so going sure. forward, right across the piece and the fact that we're having this, this conversation um, in this, uh, the, the, the today in, in, in the University of Strathclyde. So everywhere you look, um, people are really exercised by the imperative about uh, making this transition and focus wherever they happen to be, be it in technology, be it business, be it investment, um, in government agencies everywhere, um, in terms of understanding what their piece in the jigsaw is. And, and to Jim's point, and as an engineer myself, I get the, the systems engineering piece is, is hugely important to understand how all this works together. That's something we're very focused on um, increasingly in government. All those parts of the ecosystem work together okay. to, uh, to deliver on that is, Thank you. is absolutely critical. Thank you. I know you've been generous with your time. You've got to get, Thank to, you very much. Got to, get to Edinburgh. But for those of you who are fascinated by this conversation, tune in in 2044. <laughs> and then Ivan, <laughs> and, <laughs> Ivan and I will be sitting here having the conversation. All the Super. best. See you later. Bye, Bye. Now. Bye. Um, now. Brian, I wonder if I could... Um, I wonder if I could invite you to reflect on that same similar question. How long do you think um, the UK will continue to need and exploit the, re the, the geologically based resource in the North Sea? Yeah, no, and, and I think it's really important. Uh, and just to clarify, I think, uh, just to the Minister, that net zero is a gross number less than other number. Right, and, and even the engineers will get this. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's the sort of, you take a big gross number, you take something else off it. So, the, uh, I, I, but it belabors a, a fundamental point that people think net zero is zero production of fossil fuels. It is not. Uh, and, and the IPC intergovernment panel that looked at this assumed that we would still have significant <coughs> oil, gas and coal production. But, uh, there's a piece I want to come back to which is really important about energy poverty around the world because the climate targets that were set by Paris in 2015 were to keep global warming well below two degrees, which is converging to 1.5, which I think is a big ask. They're two very, very different things. Well below two and 1.5 are a very huge difference in terms of what it will take, but also eradicating poverty. And that means places like North America that consume something like 20 times the amount of energy of Africa Africa's going to have to come up that energy poverty curve in some way, and it can't just do it through renewables. And therefore, there will be a reliance on fossil fuels. And so the question of 2045 for me in terms of production, I think we will still have a thriving, important oil and gas sector in the North Sea. We'll have to, otherwise we won't be able to meet the energy requirements of the UK. And the most recent UK uh, intergovernment panel on, uh, um, on climate has come out with a report that says... Even by 2050, total electricity demand will be 700 terawatts in the UK, compared to 300 today. Total energy from oil and gas in 2050 in that same report is 350 terawatts in a total power grid of 1700. So the UK is relying on a big chunk of oil and gas in 2050 to meet its energy demands. It's, and it comes back to your ACORN question. It's what do you do with the CO2 that's, that comes alongside, alongside it? And I think in terms of optimism, my optimism is in places like Strathclyde uh, and, and the work of Jim and the engineering groups, because we've built this incredible industry in the North Sea. And, and, the, and this country has benefited from the oil and gas we've produced and the chemical products that were produced off the back of that at places like Grangemouth down the road and Hull and Runcorn in terms of Ineos. The next big phase of this energy transition, the reason why it's so exciting is all the big technological breakthroughs we had to make to build the economy we've built, we're gonna to have to do that times 10 in this next phase. And we're gonna need big engineering solutions to how we do it. And trust me, carbon capture 
is an easy thing to say. <laughs> it's a damn difficult technological problem to bridge. And I'm, we're, we're front and center on that. Den Denmark's an interesting case in point. In Denmark, they have set a cessation of production of oil and gas for 2050. So we know they're going to have no more production. They're relatively small in the North mm -hmm. Sea in terms of production, so it's an easy thing to get to. But they've got a very joined up, integrated system solution with offshore wind, which they went into first, next phase hydrogen, next phase carbon capture, and we're working with them on that. So I think my optimism comes from some of the big technology breakthroughs we've seen before and the things that we'll see here at Strathclyde. Thank you, Brian. Nishma, I wonder, the Chemical Industries Association, what's, what's your um, vantage point or perspective on the, the, the continued use? What's the right trajectory that the, the association see in terms of North Sea oil and gas? And also, what gives you grounds for, for Sir Jim's challenge um, of the sense of optimism? Yeah, so um, in terms of the oil and gas question, I think, um, I mean, referred to some of the reports already, C Committee on Climate Change, again, in their sort of abatement pathways, if you look at it, there will still be a need for oil and gas in the UK. It's about reducing that um, need and that demand and replacing it with something else. So having an en energy mix which reduces it to the extent it can, um, some will still be available, and then what it's replaced with. So alongside that, and it I think it goes back to the point I was making previously, is if we're having that shift, what policy do we need to deliver it? And also what policy do we need to um, incentivize demand? I think the point was made earlier around if we get the demand, then prices will go down, but we'll first need to incentivize that demand. There needs to be an incentive to create that demand, to move to that shift. You know, is it cheaper? Is it, is it supporting businesses um, consumers to, to move to that alternative option? So, so I think those two key th things are key. Um, in, in terms of optimism, I think it's, for me, in the UK, the progress hasn't started a few years ago. I think rules said that this is, this is three decades worth of work. And that means that we've got, you know, alongside the geographical advantage, we've got capacity here in the UK. We've also got a massive, massive skills opportunity in the UK. We have engineers, we have scientists. They have the skills. Yes, the knowledge building has to come with it around what does you know, low carbon economy need and how do you address the challenges specific to the low carbon in, um, economy. But we have it here in the UK. It's just about pushing that forward and delivering it in a way that it's affordable for all. Thank you. Gary, optimism. I'm on the happy business, Jim. I'm a trade I, union official. I know that. Sake, you know? <laughs> 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 we have four rays of sunshine and a dark cloud. <laughs> uh, first of all, oil and gas. What's your sense of oil and gas? Uh, the uh, right trajectory. What's your sense? I don't know, Jim. I'm, I'm not an engineer. I don't, yeah. the, back, the gas industry is my background. I served an apprenticeship in it. I think we're going to need gas for a very long time. I think we're going to need gas for heating homes. And in terms of the economics of what's been announced recently, it simply doesn't add up. And my huge concern is that when people wake up to the cost of this move that they're talking about, actually they've limited the, the, the move to heat pumps, which was quite interesting. But when people wake up to the costs of this and the potential impact on jobs, when we aren't creating the jobs that we've been promised, we were promised tens upon tens of thousands of jobs in renewables. People wake up to that, there will be a backlash, and I fear that backlash is going to be to the right, mm -hmm. politically, which is not where, where I sit. Um, uh, in terms of, um, well, it also makes absolutely no sense for us to be importing huge amounts of gas. We are spending hundreds of millions of pounds on importing gas every day from Siberia from Africa, from under the Amazon. And in fact, the University of Strathclyde, we had a paper produced about gas imports just prior to the pandemic. And we'll be back importing huge amounts of gas at the moment, which goes back to my point about we're exporting jobs and importing virtue, and people don't want to face up to the complexities uh, about the energy sector and gas in particular. Sorry, can I interrupt Sorry. you, but what, what, do you, what do you think the prize is? How big is the prize then there is in a jobs? Massive, there is a massive prize. There is a massive opportunity. Um, with the naval build programme that's going on at the moment, with the opportunities around renewables, every yard and every facility on the coast across the whole of the UK should be booming at the moment, creating tens of thousands of skilled jobs for working class 
uh, young people, but it's not happening because we've got no plan and we have failed to invest and we didn't do a Denmark and we've had no focus about where we're building the Aberdeen of the future. What gives me optimism in all seriousness is the people I represent, the fantastic, fantastic people, highly skilled people, people who are willing to learn, people who want to earn. We have huge ingenuity uh, amongst the types of people I represent in this country and given the opportunity, we will go on to do great things. But at the moment, the lack of planning, the lack of investment, uh, the lack of that framework uh, is holding us back. Thanks, Gary. So Jim is a humble engineer What's your reflection on the trajectory of oil and gas in Scotland, the UK, and globally, in fact? Because one of the things we don't reflect on enough is that while it's crucial to talk about Scotland and the UK, we are but a, a minor part of the global oil and gas network and market. Indeed, but as you've heard from Brian, we, we started off with a, with a vision 50 or 60 years ago in oil and gas, and we created a world-leading capability in Scotland. And I think another piece of... Uh, uh, ephemeral uh, importance is, is leadership. You know, it's a, you know, and, and, and the oil and gas industry came together, and of course they, they built industry and, and they, they drove very successful companies, but they had a vision as to what they were, they were trying to achieve. So, so just trying to unpack some of that, that, Jim. So oil and gas for me, I mean, the, the, the balance sheet and the investment capability from that industry, the technical and engineering know-how in that industry, it seems to me that now their principal commitment to going on that energy transition journey is going to be, for me, an essential part of the UK and other parts of the world achieving that new economy. Uh, and we shouldn't forget that. It's, it's, it's one can imagine, uh, you know, the uh, communications that the oil and gas has, the messaging is difficult for them. Uh, the new ESG agenda that pervades every organisation, including purpose, as well as compliance, the big investment houses are expecting to see that. Uh, so there are positive pressures from a, an ethical and professional point of view, but there are pressing practical examples of having to satisfy shareholders' expectation of that industry. So, so uh, the reality of a commitment, and, and ESG captures much of what Gary's been saying, how do we address the environmental challenges? What are societal obligations, e.g. let's create jobs, let's bring communities with us? and do that all within a good governance system. We mustn't forget the, the big canvas against which this is built. So I, I, maybe it would be helpful just to, to give you one little vignette of, of job opportunities in Scotland. I, with, uh, with support from many others, I have to say, I, I led a piece of work that I was commissioned to undertake with the Scottish Government over the past 10 months or so on looking at the offshore wind opportunity for Scotland. Uh, again, we didn't capture the economic value, we didn't get the projects over the past decade, but now, just as Scotland goes to releasing its leases through Crown Estate Scotland, there's prospectively 10 gigawatts of offshore wind to be had in Scotland alone. Now, two-thirds of that might be floating offshore wind. Now, there is an opportunity where if we invest in our ports, for example, NIG, Ardesia, coordinate with Aberdeen, Dundee and Leith, taking a systems perspective of a port cluster, then we can start to segue the knowledge we have in the subsea industry in Scotland. Uh, that industry and the industry that we, we, we're talking about today uh, know how to make floating structures, know how to service them, know how to design and optimise them from an engineering perspective. Uh, and the report that we produced uh, saw us peaking at about an additional 6,000 jobs in Scotland in many remote communities, I have to say. Uh, you know, a great champion for this is Roy McGregor up in a, a global energy, uh, you know, got an absolute champion for apprenticeships and creating activity. But again, skills are a big attractor for foreign di direct investment, as well as indigenous supply chains. So by getting that self-organizing to some extent industry cluster, it's back to leadership, the OEMs, the tier ones, helping to self-organize with their, their, their SMEs and their supply chain partners, and then being facilitated by government, because we can't forget that. Uh, the, the new net zero plan uh, is, is being challenged on, on its deliverability financially. Uh, Treasury is already saying, well, if we're going to go to electrification, we're going to lose £30 billion of uh, you know, uh, fuel revenues. So how is that going to be taken care of? So you get the thorny question, do we start putting taxation on, on road systems? It's a, as Gary said, there's some big challenges for society. Uh, I often talk about the energy trilemma which is the competing forces of cost, reliability, and decarbonisation. Uh, it's actually, it's more like a quadrilemma because we mustn't forget the real drive of public opinion 
can stop things dead in their track. And, uh, you know, you'd show me a, a politician that is unelected. There's no such thing. They're always looking to the electorate for the next phase. Uh, and very deep un un unpopular policies, as you know, Jim, can cost, uh, can cost disruption. I'm struggling <laughs> for the right euphemism. Uh, that having been said, if, uh, back to alignment. Well thought out policies, subsidies where it's required, because the off offshore wind just now is less than £40 per megawatt hour. It was £120 per megawatt hour about seven or eight years ago. That's come through market making, through contracts for differences. It's come through technological innovation, and it's come through stickability in industry. And we need more of that value for the next generation of renewables, the next generation of whether it's carbon capture and storage, which is going to be a big challenge or the hydrogen economy or more, we need to start with that vision and have the strength and the courage of our convictions to make this a long-term plan, not to the next election. Thank you, Jim. Now, we've got time for one more subject, which um, I'm going to use the facilitator's prerogative to say it's going to be hydrogen. Thank okay. you. So just to give you a little bit of a of, um, warning. Um, Brian, I wonder, look, Ineos are renowned for the sort of the ability to innovate at scale. Um, I wonder whether you could share with our audience today, but also those watching online, um, how the, the potential um, for hydrogen to transform um, our, our energy systems and what has to happen to achieve that potential? So, so hydrogen is an interesting one in that it's been one that's been looked at now for the best part of a decade. Uh, in different places and only five years ago people thought hydrogen wouldn't be commercially viable till 50. And why is hydrogen important? Because its byproduct is water. And, but today uh, the place where we get hydrogen from is from cracking a hydrocarbon molecule, that's fossil fuel, and the byproduct, uh, when we make petrol, gasolines, fuel, the byproduct is hydrogen and that's just what it is. But that's what we call grey hydrogen and that it's got all the carbon balance sheet issues associated with it. If you can take the CO2 from that and put it in the ground, carbon storage, you've now got blue hydrogen. So effectively you've got a renewable source of hydrogen. The best source in terms of the carbon balance sheet would be green hydrogen. And that's from electrolysis. And INEOS is incredibly well positioned to be able to develop and exploit that technology because of course we're into chemistry and we have a vinyl chloride business, Innovin. Uh, and we have the largest fleet of electrolyzers in Europe. So that basically means we can step into that space. What will it take? It will take governments to set in place the incentives for us to make those big investments. So we've already committed 2 billion euros this week. Uh, we'd already in in started an investment in green hydrogen a year ago almost at Rafnes up in Norway, off our old Norse Hydro position that we've got. Um, and we will look to put that money into markets where the incentives are in place to be able to make those investments. So I come back to Germany, Scandinavia, France to a degree, UK yet, we still haven't seen the framework, the, I mean, I like Jim's description of the integrated system that will allow us to start to put those investments in and create the jobs here. But we have a great position uh, to grow a green hydrogen business here, um, and that's one of the things that we've been pushing big time this week. Thank you. Right. Nishma, this is something that the, the Industry Association has focused um, significantly on, published reports, uh, advocated um, action and reform. Share with our audience um, your perspective on the opportunity of hydrogen and what needs to happen for us to, to achieve international or global leadership on it. Yeah. I think there's, um, there's two elements to this. So um, Committee on Climate Change again in their six carbon budget, um, if you look at their projections, they, they, they state out that obviously clean, uh, hydrogen, clean electricity and retrofitting CC, CCS um, could potentially abate 90% of emissions within, within industry. Um, CCS has been around for, for quite some time. It was, in, it was one of our previous roadmaps, if you like, that we did with government. Um, yep, we don't yet have a complete fully operational plant. Great that we've got some of the, the clusters engaged in the track one process. But I think when, when you look at the two put together, CCS and, and the link to hydrogen and also the hydrogen capability we have in the UK, the opportunity is massive. It's huge. We've got the ambition and commitment to say we want to go harder and faster and want to be leading ambition. We've also got the capability. I think, as it was just said, we just now need one where we've got the 
viable projects coming forward to government, implement them. If they're viable, if, they're, if, if the capability is there, let's do them all. Let's, let's not wait another five or 10 years to, to bring that next stage in. So that's one thing. I think the other thing is, is the framework, the, the business models is, is one part of it, making sure that they actually allow the investment to come in. Government want to, I think, what did I, in the net zero strategy, they were looking for mobilizing around 100 billion, 200 billion um, private investment. To enable to do that, you need the business models that will attract that investment in. So that's the other thing. And then the final thing, no matter how viable the project is from an industry's perspective, if the infrastructure is not around to develop it, those projects will go out where we're a global industry, um, even within businesses, there will be competition on where that money goes. So we need the infrastructure here in the UK to deliver it. Okay. Thank you. Gary, what, what's the union's perspective on the hydrogen and what needs to change for UK manufacturing and UK employment um, to be the sort of boon that comes out of hydrogen? Um, we've said for a long time that hydrogen has to be part of the solution. The idea, as somebody used to fit and fix gas boilers, the idea that we were going to rip gas boilers off the wall at the cost of thousands and move to the electrification of heat, uh, the economics were always going to, uh, we're never going to stack up with that easily and uh, whatever the politicians might have said. Um, so hydrogen has to be part of the solution. And as I said earlier, I was at JCB yesterday, hugely important manufacturer for the UK, doing some terrific stuff, a global brand, global business, employing thousands of our members doing highly skilled work. They're not going to run their big construction machines on batteries. So hydrogen has to be part of the solution. Um, I, I feel very passionately that there has been too much stop start around energy for, for too long. There's been an oversimplification about energy policy. We reduce things to slogans and actually energy is enormously complicated. And we do, the key thing for me is always about planning. We used to plan very well in energy. That's what we did in the post-war period. And that's what we need to get back to. And working with communities, working with trade unions uh, and not imposing solutions on them. And finally, I would say this, in terms of the oil and gas and chemical sector, we need to see what they are and celebrate these sectors as part of the solution and stop demonizing them because that's what's happened in the world of politics. Thank you, Kenneth. So, Jim. I think we've had a great description of, of the hydrogen options just now. Uh, and uh, you're right, we're on that transition to, to green hydrogen and, and the, the electrolysis technology such as Aeneas has. And, and you see some very big commitments in France, for example. I've been involved in recent seminars with go their government officials. You know, big, you know, multiple hundreds of megawatts plans over the next couple of years to, to many gigawatts. Now, just now, uh, in the, the UK energy strategy and, and the Scottish government's hydrogen strategy, we're looking at five gigawatts by 2030. Uh, but it could be more, but it'll only happen if we've got that plan, if we've all got the understanding of how we integrate the great knowledge in companies like Ineos within the oil and gas industry generally, and then how we use hydrogen. Because as an electrical engineer, I smile sometimes that we often just think about sources like generation and end use, but forget that something has to connect in between, like the networks for me in electrical systems. We need that migration to a smart grid. Same is true for hydrogen. How do we transport it? Uh, you know, the you know the migration from from the natural gas system to include hydrogen. There are there are mixed opportunities, but it won't necessarily be the right way to do it. So we're likely to start correctly in high temperature industries where hydrogen can be used to decarbonise the processes. But we need to put in place the plan and the phasing to do that. Uh, and your point about let's get going is critically important. Uh, I gave my professorial inaugural lecture in 1990 and I was, I was talking about back to the future. And I was saying, it was, we've only got a decade to get this done. Here we are in 2021 and there's less than 1500 weeks to 2050. That's sobering in a, when you think about planning, innovation, deployment, investment, creating jobs, creating competitive advantage. But the Royal Academy of Engineering is just about to publish a, a paper just in advance of COP26 to address just this point about get going. Uh, and it's a low regrets options paper. Uh, you know, the Committee for Science and Technology and Cabinet Office now have said that they understand that there needs to be that move on that pathway to 2050. And you know what, we need to have a bigger risk appetite than we, we, we often have. There will be things that will work well, things that won't work well, uh, but we need to take that risk to get going. And the, for me, Jim, the obvious things will be, let's get to late stage R&D and industrial scale demonstration of hydrogen technologies in use. 
CCUS, and I know that there's been some uh, you know, ruffle feathers over the past week with regard to the, the UK government's commitment to where they'll place the CCS demonstration. You know, the, uh, the ACON project for me is a, is a fantastic project, great people, great opportunities, and hopefully it's not now mothballed. We need to redouble our efforts to try and attract further investment into that project. So hydrogen, CCUS, let's get the electricity charging infrastructure that's required for vehicles. Let's think about that move towards decarbonising homes. But let's not just think about it. Let's start doing it. Uh, uh, because we can't, with all due respect to uh, what the Minister was saying earlier, we can't come back here in 2044 and figure out where we are. We can't wait till 2049. 2030 for me is a massive milestone. If we're not well down the track towards decarbonising, then we will not achieve these laudable but challenging objectives that we've laid out. I think, that's a, I think that's a great point to bring our conversation to a conclusion today, which is that it's about the combination of thinking, acting, and then tracking um, trajectory towards net zero, be it in 2045 or 2050 or any period uh, um, in between. I'd like to thank um, all of our contributors and panellists today, um, Brian, Ivan, Nishma, Gary, Sir Jim, um, I'd like to thank INEOS and the University of Strathclyde for hosting this joint event today. I'd like to thank our audience who have joined us in a COVID-sensitive way and to those who are watching online. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation, our deliberations, the occasional point of friction, but the generation of um, optimism of an energy of the future and a sense of just the real passion that exists um, amongst our guests today. So thank you very much indeed.